All right. Hello, everyone. Welcome to MCLA and tonight's Green Living Seminar presentation. I'm Elena Traster in the Environmental Studies Department. This semester's Green Living Seminar is orga organized around the theme of sustainable food and farming. All presentations are free and open to the public. They take place on Thursdays at 5.30 here in the Feigenbaum Center for Science and Innovation, room 121. Today's presentation will last probably around 40, 45 minutes or so. Um, we have Trevor Mance, owner of Tam Organics, speaking on Closing the Loop, Composting Food Waste, um, and we are so glad that you're here today. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for having me. Um, I am not a presenter by trade. I am a garbage man and a composter and a recycler. So afford me the, uh, the hopefully I do good. <laughs> but with that, please, I, I, I get, not being a speaker, I love interaction. I love to know what the folks in the audience know and, and what kind of levels that I'm talking to. Because I can, I can sometimes get away from myself and go really technical, and then I think I, I see the glazed-over look from people, and they're like, "Oh no!" <laughs> so please, uh, by all means, uh, put up your hand if you have a question. If uh, if you have something that's that's really interests you, uh, we can certainly spend a little bit more time on it. I will try to get through everything, so we kind of complete the. We'll close the loop on my presentation as well as the the food tonight. So a uh, little background. Um, Again, uh, Elena gave me a nice introduction. I'm Trevor Mance, owner of TIM. I've been in the waste and recycling industry for 23 years. Uh, I started in high school uh, working for a local transfer station, telling people where to put their bottles. I love people and I love the environment. So when a hauler decided to sell his business, I decided that that's what I should do for my high school Saturday. Um, so I bought that business and have stayed with it. Uh, went to Hudson Valley for two years, finished at Siena College with a marketing management degree, and uh, just can't figure out what I want to do when I grow up. So here I am, 23 years later. <laughs> um, and so TAM now is a, is got three different areas. We have the uh, TAM Inc. is is a hauling company. We service about 8,500 residential houses a week. Uh, about 1,200 uh, commercial accounts, and we have about 400 roll-offs out there doing demolition and scrap metal and things like that. Um, TAM Recycling uh, is a company that sorts single-stream recycling, so we have um, all the sorting equipment. We bail things and put them uh, into their number ones, number twos, fibers, and, and so on. Uh, and what we're here to talk about tonight, which is TAM Organics. Uh, and TIM Organics, we compost food waste, and we'll kind of get into the feedstocks in a minute, but the premise is, is that we compost food waste, leaf waste, yard waste, uh, manures, and an interesting feedstock, uh, money, but we'll talk about that later. We're the only composter in the country that composts money. <laughs> um, so yeah, uh, now, 23 years later, TIM, the family, we have almost 70 employees. Uh, we operate in three states, Vermont, Massachusetts, and New York. Um, and how did I get involved in composting? So I, I've always loved the environment. Uh, I wanted to do a solar project because as haulers, we kind of have to green our image because we're kind of seen as the, the big bad garbage haulers. So. Um, I really was into solar for a while, and lo and behold, I didn't have the tax appetite, because you have to actually make money to have a tax appetite to get solar, so that didn't work out so well. And it was a, one day I was watching a, a Price Chopper compactor get dumped, and I was dumping in, it went up, and I, I saw 13 tons of food waste, which we do every single week, dump on the floor. And it hit me, and I was like, what? <laughs> like, hello, here's the environmental project. Um, if you want to green your image, it's internalizing a cost. So the garbage world, we dump our garbage at a landfill. It's usually owned by one of the big garbage companies, and it costs a lot of money to do that. Um, so I could avoid tip fees, which is what we call our disposal cost, and compost the food and make a, a product. Um, so my, my family lineage is my mother's a school teacher, my father's a forester. So you put those two together, and I love to learn, and I love the, the environment. So grew up maple sugaring and, and as a forester's kid marking down the tree tallies out in the woods. So, <laughs> um, so it made a lot of sense. Uh, it didn't make a lot of financial sense. Uh, so composting is a labor of love. Of the three companies, composting is definitely our financially 
least profitable. In fact, it's not profitable, but um, what I do find is it's a great loss leader because it's wonderful to go into businesses and say, hey, we can provide your garbage removal, we can provide your compost, and we can provide your recycling. Because a key component to any organics program for a business is seeing the garbage go down and the composting go up and being able to constantly kind of make sure that they're in harmony. So if you've got a six-yard dumpster and a compost bin, now we triple your composting and we take that six-yard dumpster and we bring it down to a four. So it, the, the idea of kind of having all three things is, is really attractive. Um, so TIM Organics started about six or seven years ago. Um, we are... We compost about 38,000 yards of material, um, and how we do that is we use a aerobic uh, process. So basically, to deal with organic waste, you have two choices. You have to, you have to decide right off the bat, are you going to do it anaerobically or aerobically? Uh, fancy words for with air or without air. People have probably heard of anaerobic digesters. Uh, anaerobic digesters means that you are taking food waste and you are sealing it and in the absence of oxygen food waste will create methane. They capture that methane and they use it for power generation. You still need to you still need to compost what comes out of the digester. Uh, so uh, anaerobic or yeah, an anaerobic process kind of requires both, but you're sucking a lot of the energy so the compost you get at the end is void or at least much reduced on nitrogen levels. So it's kind of more of just organic matter. It does not have the same kind of bacterial profile that that uh, aerobic process has. So we use a combination of uh, forced air and uh, turned windrow. So a forced air system is kind of what you see here. And, and what this is, is this is the first trial that we did with this. We have a fan blower here that's on a timing system that turns on every six minutes out of every 10. It blows air into whatever one of these that we have open. And this is a wood chip plenum layer. A plenum layer is just a fancy word for we need something for that oxygen because it because there's six inch PVC pipes that run through that with holes in them. We don't want to plug those holes. So we, we put wood coarse wood chips so it allows the air to kind of uniformly come up through the piles. That's called a static aerated pile. A turned windrow system is where you turn the piles many times. And as a uh, medium-sized composter in Vermont, we have certain uh, state requirements, a lot of state requirements, and one of the biggest ones is called PFRP, Process to Further Reduce Pathogens. And what that is, is as a commercial composter, we take everything. So if it was a plant or an animal, we'll take it. We will take, um, we just had somebody slaughter seven cows, and we took all the, the guts and stuff. We take meat, we take bones, we take seafood, uh, things that you would not use in your home compost. So and I'll take a little dog leg quickly on the difference between home compost and commercial compost. Home compost, uh, does anybody home compost? Great. So you all know that meat, bones, dairy are kind of no-nos, and that's because you don't get the high temperatures that you need um, whereas in commercial composting, within 24 hours, we've got our blend perfect. It's being blended with a bucket loader. Everything's just the way it should be, and it comes up to 130 degrees in 24 hours, and we cook it. So back to the PFRP, the process to further reduce pathogens. State requirement says on a aerated static pile like this, where we put the forced air through it, for, we have to have it on the forced air system in over 131 degrees for three consecutive days, and then we have to turn it, and then we have to do it for another, it has to then go another um, seven days. If we do the turned windrow, it's got to be up to between 131 and 164 for 13 out of 16 consecutive days and five turnings in there. So when you're handling 38,000 yards of material, the idea of turning it five times in 13 to, in that 16-day window gets very laborious. And, and with big bucket loaders burning a lot of fuel, it doesn't work. So we achieve really two things. We get through our PFRP phase with our aerated static pile, and we save money. 
Uh, and then we go to the turned windrow because compost is like our mother's spaghetti, right? Like the sauce. You don't rush the sauce. <laughs> you can't throw it all together and serve it. It's got to cook for a while. So composting is the same way. You, you can't, anybody that tells you in any magic fangled thing that's going to spit out compost in like three weeks does not happen. Yes, sir. Trevor, a, a silly question. Um, why, I understand the high temperature, but why do you need to do it for a certain amount of time? Thank you. So what we're doing in that time and why the state requires the turnings and why they require the temperature. The low end of the temperature, the 131, is at the point that bacteria get killed. So I know that I have E. coli. I know that I have salmonella. You know, that's, that is a reality that we deal with. And so over 131, I'm cooking it. You know, any of the cooks out here, you know, medium rare is what, 140? Um, so we're cooking to proper temperature as if you were cooking a steak in your, in your grill. Um, now the high end, the 164, at 164 degrees, nitrogen volatilizes and it turns into ammonia. So you will get an ammonia smell from a compost jar if you're over 164. And yes, we can get over 164. The highest temperature we've ever gotten was 185, and it was because we took in a couple hundred thousand eggs. Um, Vermont Food Bank had a tractor trailer, and the generator, the gen set, went out because they forgot to put fuel in it. So they had a full tractor trailer load of eggs that went bad. They actually didn't go bad, but the FDA wouldn't let them be served so because they just missed the window. So we got a 48-footer of hundreds of thousands of eggs that we mixed in, but there was so much nitrogen in it, and the pile got so hot. We were, And then how you fix that is you turn. So we were out there every couple days because you can get them hot enough to start them on fire. Uh, so, yeah, that's um, the low ends to make sure that it gets cooked. The high end is to make sure that it doesn't get smelly. And the turnings is because the outside of the pile will not achieve that 131. So you got to get the outside to the inside. Um, with a forced air system, you're pushing the air. And this is called a positive system. There's two systems out there. Positive air means you push through the pipes. Negative air means you pull, and you pull the air down through the pile. So are you heating the air before you pump it through? No. And that 185 degree day time was in the middle of winter. It was 10 degrees below zero hours. So the compost itself is generating that much heat? Yes. Wow. Yep. Uh, there's tons of stuff out there. If anybody's interested, heat recovery and compost. Fantastic topic. I have aspirations someday. I, I, we could go into a whole different living Green Living seminar on that. There's tons of heat in compost. Um, and so, like I say, on a 10 degree degree day, you'll see frost on the outside and you'll scratch three inches in, you'll be at 100. By our one foot probe will be at 130, 140. Um, nothing is added other than the bacteria eating, consuming the, um, the, the materials in there. Yes, sir. What are you powering your um, blower with? We are, we are actually on a generator. Uh, where our compost yard is, it, we do not have power, so we, uh, we just generate our power. So aerobic process. So how we get the compost to cook at these temperatures? That the key, as I said, versus a home compost, and I'm going to give everyone full disclosure, I'm a horrible home composter. And my daughter's here tonight. Do we still home compost? No, we don't. <laughs> we, we put it in the bucket and Daddy takes it to work now. <laughs> so home composting is actually really hard because getting the ratio correct is not easy on a small scale. You know, and, and also we'll, and we'll talk about the kind of the things that go into it. And carbon to nitrogen ratio, we're going to talk about moisture, and we're going to talk about the fact that it needs air. But those are kind of the things. Moisture content, carbon to nitrogen, and uh, air is, is the key. So what we're looking for, roughly speaking, um, is a four to one carbon to nitrogen ratio. Put very simply, carbon are your browns, nitrogen are your greens. So if anybody's heard about you know mixing your browns and greens, it's kind of a dumbed down way of looking at it. Um, I took a master composters course 
and I have not seen formulas like I saw there since I took calc. Um, they, they are really complicated, but what's really cool is you can send out your feedstock to a lab and they send you back what the carbon content is, and then you can very simply put together a recipe, and that's what we've done. And once we have our recipe, we stick with it. Um, so, like in this picture, this is kind of a hodgepodge picture, but I, I like it because this is our compost yard. Here is corn stalks that we took in. Here is leaf waste that we took in. And this is horse manure. Um, we do try to keep them separate. And actually, this is straw from Saratoga Racetrack up there. Um, so we, it is important that we have our different feedstocks because some things come in very differently. Food waste is very, very high moisture. Your food is typically between uh, 70 and 80 percent water. And what happens is as soon as you get that into a compost situation, that water releases very quickly. It's kind of like if you, when you cook vegetables, you know, you heat them up, you see your mushrooms go from, wow, look at all those mushrooms, to nothing. The same thing with spinach. It just releases all that water. Um, so as I have in the slide, carbon items, things like horse manure, leaf waste, wood chips, and corn stalks. Nitrogen is, is like grass clippings. Grass is kind of interesting. When it's fresh, it's got high nitrogen. If you actually dry it out, it actually becomes a carbon product. Um, and then chicken manure is super high nitrogen. If anybody has ever used chicken manure in a garden, it's wild. Yeah. Just out of curiosity, why is horse manure a carbon product and chicken manure is a nitrogen? Uh, so chicken is, I don't know why chicken is so high nitrogen. Um, it's got a really high ammonia smell, which is, again, that volatilizing of nitrogen. So chicken is a volatile one that we actually don't want. Um, horse manure is so high on wood chips. So there's carbon, and then again, here we go into the complicated part of composting. It's not just carbon, it's available carbon. If I take a chunk, if this happened to be real wood, this is pure carbon. So I can't take this and I can't throw it in my compost bin and say, okay, now I can take one-fourth of this in nitrogen. Nothing is available about it. So surface area and ability to break down is so crucial. Uh, so if you have a home compost bin, they, they, some people talk about twigs. Twigs don't give you much available carbon. If you have sawdust, that really small size is great because that, that's very available for the bugs to attack. They can only get at the outside. So the 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 denser and the bigger the block of material, the less available the carbon is. Does that make sense? Any questions on that? Um, so the other thing that we put in is lots of wood chips. Wood chips, not so available, but absolutely crucial for porosity and structure of the piles. Because we deal with such wet things, if you don't have the wood chips kind of adding structure. Your piles, you'll, you'll stack them up. They'll be nice. A, you know, a typical windrow on our forest air systems, 30 feet wide, 15 feet tall, and we do 120 feet of pipes, and we build one of those every week. Um, if, you don't, if we don't have the right mix and we don't have enough wood chips, you'll watch that pile in 24 hours start to go like this and just woof, pancake out. And it's a disaster because you lose the porosity, you lose your oxygen, and then you got a really bad odor problem. Um, so wood chips are vital for more on the, por the air side than they are on the carbon side. So we want to get things in there like leaf waste, and we want to get the horse manure in, which is very available. And, uh, and it's also the animal, really, that a horse's stomach is very crude. I mean, what comes out is so fibrous, and it's, um, it's not broken down well. And you take a cow, which is so high liquid content, um, and again, higher on the nitrogen scale. We don't use any dairy at, or any cow manure at all. Uh, it's an odor problem. It's too wet, and it would take so much dry material, and we'll get to moisture in a second, that it doesn't work for us. Speaking of, moisture content, 65% is what we want. Food waste is about 70 to 80%. Um, so what we need to do is we need to mix our feedstocks to achieve that 65%. Uh, if somebody here is mixing up a pile of compost, uh, you can take a handful of it and you can squeeze it. And if you open up your hand and it falls apart, it's less than 50%. If you squeeze it and you can see water between your fingers, that's kind of perfect, but it doesn't run out. 
that's about that 60 to 65 percent. And if it's over 65 percent, when you squeeze it, you'll have water drip off your hands. So it's kind of a Yankee ingenuity way of figuring out how what your moisture content is. Um, that is a huge one. If it's too wet, it does not compost. Um, it drowns out those bugs, and, and you just don't get it. And that's what I get in my home compost. We made great slime, and we killed a lot of food. You know, we just kept putting food in; it would disappear and disappear. I called it like the the magical bucket. But at the end of it, I never got some beautiful black dirt. <laughs> um, so, the other feedstock that I alluded to before is is currency. So, we are the composter for Crane Company. For anybody that knows Crane Company, they're in Dalton, Mass, and they produce all of the U.S. currency. Um, so, in the currency making process they're the original recyclers as they like to say and so our currency our money is made with blue jeans ground up and cotton so cotton waste so they recycle to make that and then that goes into the screens and out comes what they harvest the longer cotton fibers and the short cotton fibers make it through and it goes through a treatment process and we get what they call cotton sludge um, it sounds like a bad word. I shouldn't call that. Short cotton fiber is the other technical term of it. So it's cotton and it's actually got flax in it too. Um, so every so often, which is kind of on a, a neat thing, it, it meant that we lost our certified for organic use uh, certification, but you can find USA 20 strips, little plastic strip every so often in our compost. <laughs> and when you hold up a, a dollar bill, or a, I think it's 20s and bigger, you can see that little strip. It's not often that they run bad bills, but when they do, we'll, we'll see that stuff come through. So when I figure out how to put it back together, you will not get me to do a convers another one of these. I'll be on a beach somewhere. <laughs> Question. So did you say it was the ink in the currency? No, it's pre-ink. So and what, what caused you to lose certification for organic? So you can't use any residuals in certified for organic use compost. And we had it for a while. But um, maybe this is as good a time as any to digress for a second into the economics of compost. So compost, as a composter, you have to make a decision off the bat. Do you want to make high-end certified for organic use compost and get premium dollar for it? Or do you want, and wait 14 months to get paid? Or do you want to have a residual with a weekly cash flow? I started, I think everybody should, we always start at the highest ethical and and uh, production that you can do. And so I did that, and I, we made fantastic organic compost. And we could sell it for $69 a yard, but we found that there was only so many gardeners out there. And then so we were making a lot of it, and we dropped it a little bit, we still had the same amount. And all we did was cannibalize our own market. So we sold that 1,000 yards, and every week I had to pay the two guys up there and put fuel in the loader and pay for the loader and the tires and everything else. And I said, this is killing me. <laughs> so I had to flip that on its head. So I said, all right, I'm going to go out and I'm going to find a paying feedstock. So we get paid to take the cotton and we take a lot of it. If anybody knows what a 30 yard roll off is, it's 22 feet long, five feet tall and eight feet wide. We do two to three of those a day of cotton. So it's from crane. So it goes up to Bennington. Um, so now I'm in an equally weird conundrum because I'm making a whole bunch of compost. <laughs> and the nice thing is that we don't have to go, we don't have to sell it for $69 a yard, but even at $20 a yard, $10 a yard, I can't move the 15,000 yards I need to move in a year. Um, so we'll get to the, at the end of the talk, I've got like, where do we go from here type thing. So. Um, any questions on moisture content? Yes. You were squeezing. Yep. Was it 50 to 65 percent? 65 is what you want. So it, it'll it crumble at less than 50. You won't get any water between 50 and 60. And then you'll just start to see that little bit of water in between your fingers at 60 to 65. That's the sweet spot. So here's our compost yard. Um, so again, this is kind of here. This is now that we're actually using them. Here's that same aerated system. Here's a bay and here's a bay. Uh, and actually we have the third bay over here. 
So you can't see it, but you can see the fence post and in that area, this whole half the yard, and this is kind of the split, goes down to a pond. I talked about E. coli and I talked about bacterias and stuff that we have to treat. So anything that has not met that PFRP drains into a pond. Any of that liquid is collected. All that liquid is either reused for moisture, if we need to bump up our moisture because it's still an active pile, um, or it goes to the sewer treatment plant. So, and that's a lined pond. So we protect the environment. We are a certified facility, which is, it, it's important. It's not, you want to be really careful if you hear of like somebody that wants to start a compost yard and just mix all this stuff in their backyard because the runoff is high phosphorus. It's all the things in Vermont. We're very concerned about all these things with Lake Champlain and stuff. And, and especially when you handle meat, it's, it's not kind of like, for beginners, although I was. <laughs> Somehow I got through it. Um, so then it goes, after it meets its PFRP stage, it then goes to the curing area, which these, you can see how black those are. Interestingly, it's on the air for three weeks. And I, it's longer than I need to go, but we don't need to move it, so why, why push it through the system again? It's all that oxygen really does a great job. In, in three weeks, in one week, food is unrecognizable. In three weeks, it's black. It's already cooked with that forced air system. It's just phenomenal how well it works. Um, and so it goes on to that curing side. We don't have to collect that water. We still run it through a sand filter to filter out just the, um, the sediment. Um, but it spends about nine months curing. Again, back to the spaghetti analogy. You can't rush it. It's still, if it has oxygen demand, it kills your roots. So we have to do what they call the Solvita test on it, which is an oxygen demand test. We, we do, we t just take it a step further and we do a, what they call a bioassay. A bioassay is, well, let me finish with Solvita. You take the compost, you put it in a jar, you put a strip and you shut the lid and it turns the paper a certain color if it's consuming all the oxygen. It's kind of like cumbersome because at the end of the day, you want to make sure it grows really well. So we do bioassays, which is a fancy word for saying that we take uh, certain things, we test beans and we uh, test uh, tomatoes, things in the broadleaf family for a different reason I'll get to. But as long as the, the grasses and the tomatoes and beans grow really well, then we say, okay, that windrow's available for sale. And then we kind of say, because we, we chart all the windrows through the process so we can tell if there was any kind of quality control problem. We, we, we know where they all are. Um, so why do we do broadleaf? Uh, and what are the problems that we're looking for? The compost world got hit with um, a really bad issue. Maybe you guys heard about it, the persistent herbicide. Does that ring a bell with anybody? Persistent herbicides, um, there's two bad actors, uh, aminopyrrolid and clopyrrolid. Uh, they, are, they do require an applicator's license. They are a, a herbicide that's used and it works really good in the fields. As the, as the people like to say, even DEC in Vermont is like, well, this is the deal. It's like your kid. It's, they're a straight A student, but they come home and they misbehave. I mean, it's a really good herbicide. It has a half life of one hour in, in pure water. So it does not pollute the environment. But lo and behold, it makes it through the stomachs of horses and cows and any animal. So, Yes, you can't just go out there to the, to the store and buy something in the pyrolid family and use it and then come in on grass clippings, although that happens and we don't take any um, commercial grass clippings, so no golf course grass, grass, grass clippings. But we had it show up um, through horse manure, and the horses were being fed beet pulp, and the beet pulp was being grown in the Midwest. Um, and that is how connected we all are in this world. Um, and it is effective under four parts per billion. So think of that for a second. That's four people in a billion people. If you have that in your compost, what happens is, is it, it affects the broadleaf family, and you'll, it'll, the plant will grow, and then the leaves will curl, and you'll have much, much or no uh, fruit on that plant. Yes, sir. I was going to say, how do, you, how do you test for those two? Bioassays. We would go bankrupt trying to do the testing because it's an expensive test. 
um, and you know pretty quick. You, you, you grow some plants in it and within, once it sprouts and it gets about this tall, you'll start to see that curl and kind of failure to thrive. Um, so Green Mountain Compost in Vermont had it. It cost them over a million dollars in damages. Green Mountain Compost is uh, Chittenden County Solid Waste District, so it is a government agency. Uh, Burlington is in Chittenden County. It's the biggest county in the, in the state and they were lucky to have all the resources of a very wealthy uh, county behind them. I could not take that hit. Uh, so we're, we're very worried about that. But another cool thing, lo and behold, I don't think I can see it in this picture, but if I had a pile of really black stuff. Uh, the, somebody smarter than me figured out that there's a power plant in Maine that burns really inefficiently. And they actually put out this charcoal, it's, it looks like biochar if anybody's ever seen biochar. Jet black and it's, it's just a wood power plant that doesn't have all the new stuff. So if you mix that in at 2%, it locks up the herbicide and it completely negates the problem. So we use that. It's also extremely good at odor suppression. Anybody knows charcoal filters? Um, so when we do up one of these windrows, we cap the windrow with a mixture of active compost, so stuff that just came off, still nice and hot, still very much biologically active. We mix in um, the charcoal and we mix in wood chips uh, and it does a fantastic job. Even though we're positive air and we're pushing, that kind of one foot blanket on the top does a great job of um, odor suppression. And then when it gets mixed into the process, when it makes it over to the curing pad and then a couple more turns, it's being blended and we've taking care of the persistent herbicide issue. Um, so that's, that's a big positive. Yes, ma'am. Um, could you repeat the two names of the herbicides? Clo it's the pyrolid family. So clopyrolid and aminopyrolid. And you can buy them over the counter? You cannot buy them over the counter. You have to have an applicator's license. Um, but that being said, that, that came about, you could buy them on Amazon. <laughs> And again, the, the wild, wild web, as I like to call it, it it's, it's kind of scary um, what you can kind of buy on the black market, so to speak. And it's just that each state has its own rule. In Vermont, you have to have an applicator's license, but in a state that doesn't require that, Amazon's free to sell it, so they don't kind of differentiate where they're selling it. I forget the, um, the trade names, but I should look that up. Um, and have that because there's it's two different um, it's two different trade names that they go by it's like striker or something or I can't remember but, but if you look up pyrolid persistent herbicide pyrolid family you'll get a whole bunch of stuff so I kind of hit on this uh, sorry for repeating uh, so we operate a commercial compost facility in Bennington Vermont it's about 35 40 minutes from here we're fully permitted with uh, Vermont Department of Environmental Conservation classified as a medium facility, so we can handle up to 40,000 yards, and we're about 35,000 yards of total incoming feedstock, uh, and we handle about 1,500 tons of food waste a year. Our service territory on the food waste, kind of Rutland area down to, we do service MCLA, Williams College, um, and a bunch of other local businesses here uh, in kind of the northern Berkshire area. We get over to Wilmington and Dover and run that Route 100, the ski area, uh, we do not go into New York. One of the reasons is, is that um, Mass has a food waste ban for large generators. Vermont has a food waste ban now almost down to the residential level. Next year will be residential included. We're down to 18 tons per year. Um, so we pretty much have, everybody's kind of required to compost. That was a big, a big boom for us. I started the compost yard before the ban. I was really excited for the ban. And it's kind of a neat story of how that all transpired. So on day one, the big institutions, the Hannafords, the Price Choppers, the hospital, the vet's home, um, we got food waste carts out there, and we picked up a whole bunch of food waste. We were putting, well, they started you know, like a Price Chopper, they, give us five food waste carts. We don't have much food waste. After week one, give us 10, give us 20, pick us up twice a week. Then all of a sudden, <laughs> they saw the... 30 carts lined up behind the, the supermarket. And guess what? They had food waste. 
So what happened was, and everybody saw this, and I think it's a great exercise for anybody. If you think that you're not generating food waste, I challenge you, get a five-gallon bucket and put it in there and see what you're throwing away in a week. You will be shocked. Uh, and that's what happened on a, on a big commercial scale. So Price Chopper looked at that and said, oh, shoot, we got to do something about this. It's still costing us a lot of money, both on the composter and on the fact that we're wasting all this food. So great idea. Everything has an expiration date. Well, 11 o'clock before midnight of the next day, freeze it. So they froze it and they gave it to the Vermont Food Bank. Vermont Food Bank's uh, donations went up 70% in the first six months of the large generators being pulled into this. So while I was sad to see the, the food waste goal go away, what an incredible benefit you know, to, to see that food waste go back to, to humans that need it. Um, just phenomenal. So total score for everybody involved. Um, and there's plenty of food waste out there for us. We're good. We, you know, 1,500 tons is a, is a lot of food waste still. Um, so again, kind of back to the process. Sorry for the the picture here of me. Like I usually don't do pictures of me. I'm <laughs> so as a little thing, if you want to hear more about the waste industry, the reason why I have that picture of me is that I did an interview for the Library of Congress. They were very interested in how garbage men work. So she came and did some photos, and it's going to be on the Library of Congress if anybody wants to hear an interview, a long interview. So here's the mixing of the feedstock. So this is kind of how we, we mix. What you see is actually money. This is that cotton sludge. This is this stuff here, wood chips. And then the food waste was already kind of put in. And we do it in a lasagna fashion. So we'll lay down a layer of something, then we'll lay down another layer of something, and we just kind of put it in, in in layers. And then when you take the bucket loader in, you pick it up and you just drop it and it cascades. And that does a really good job of blending. Um, I would recommend the same for a home compost. You layer your stuff in there and then turn it. And, and when that turning action will, will get you a nice cross-section of everything. So again, we kind of touched on this. After three weeks on the forced air system, the piles get moved to the curing area and screened. Uh, the and screened is that nine months, 10 month process. Screening compost is very complicated. Um, by nature, compost absorbs a lot of water, uh, can absorb 300% of its water. Anybody that's ever screened anything knows that wet is not good. So we struggle with how to screen compost. This is a picture of a star screen. Um, we rented one of those last, last year. Um, they're very expensive, $21,000 for the month, um, and we still couldn't get it to screen compost really well. <laughs> uh, so we screen to a half inch, and what we're recovering, bones and stuff will make it through the process a couple times. You know, you take a good-sized bone, and, and it'll, it'll get smaller, and we hope that it gets run over by the loader and it breaks into pieces, and after a couple times through, that disappears. Clam shells, they're really brittle by the first run. Um, you can actually take them and crush them in your hand. They've been kind of broken down enough. Um, but that's what we're recovering when we screen. Uh, we want the wood chips back. We use an incredible amount of wood chips, and we can't get enough. Um, and we want uh, any of the, obviously, the, the bones and stuff out. So benefits of composting. Like, why do we do this, right? Um, so a, a neat little takeaway fact, and actually how I... How I sold, I, I said to myself, I got to figure out how to sell compost services, and I'm going to go to the hardest one, or so I thought. So the first customer I went after was Burger King. I said, if I can get a fast food joint to compost, I'm good. So I went in and I said, guys, look, um, this is the deal. I want you to compost. And I got the typical head shake, and I said, well, listen, this is the deal. We all agree, don't care what side of the political aisle you're on, we all agree that global warming is here. We all can see the pictures and it bothers us of the polar bear floating on the ice cap out in the ocean. I don't care how we got here, but I can tell you that if you make the decision to put your food waste into that bucket instead of into that garbage can, every time that bucket fills up, that five-gallon bucket, it's the same as not burning a gallon of gas for emissions. So the longer answer to that is, as we talked about in the beginning, when you in the absence of oxygen, you have a anaerobic process. That's what a landfill is. That's why landfills put off tons of methane. 
And don't let the landfill guys tell you, don't worry, we collect it and turn it into power. At best, they capture about 20% of the methane. The rest is going off. And you can only capture the methane once the landfill is capped. So if it takes you 50 years to fill it, you've already lost all that methane for 50 years. Methane is 21 times more potent as a greenhouse gas than CO2. What do I make in my compost piles? CO2. We make That's what an aerobic process. We're consuming the oxygen and they're putting, the bugs are putting off just like we breathe out CO2. That's what they're putting out. So back to Burger King. I saw the heads lift and I said, you know, hey, we can't afford Priuses and we can't afford solar panels on our house. We can't, you know, but this is what you can do. And week one, <laughs> there was four carts of beautiful source separated from the employees compost. I went back in there and I was like, guys, I am so proud of you. I learned, as I've learned many things in 23 years, that it's never what you think. The high-end restaurants are the hardest ones to get to do it. <laughs> Fast food is, they're the easiest because it's so programmed. I mean, it, it, it's programmed down to you put your lettuce and then you put your tomato on top of it and then you put the bun and it's got the pictures right there. So when they added the picture of where to put the food waste, it was slam dunk. It's perfect. <laughs> so, but every, every place I go into is a challenge with setting up. So anyways, back to benefits of composting. So that's the whole little fun fact about that. It supports the economy. Whether you recycle and recycling can be either composting or recycling. For every one job lost in waste management, uh, four are gained by composting. So what I mean by that is anybody that runs the loader and the, and the track thing at the landfill is going to say, well, you're taking work away from me. Yes, it's true. But for every one of those guys that loses his job, uh, four other men or women over here are going to have a job because it takes more labor to do it. Um, so it's an economic boom. Uh, it, for the job market. Relate, creates relationships between industries. That's not one that people probably recognize, but I love that one. I love the fact that we can get these conversations going, hence the reason why I, I enjoy coming to talks like this. And I love that we can have the food industry talking to the garbage industry, talking to the packaging industry, talking to the egg industry, about the the pyrolid family. I mean, it's it, it's really neat to to kind of recognize that waste is kind of an, an all encompassing thing. I love my job because when I pick up the phone at the office, I don't know if I'm going to have someone that has one dime in their pocket, but they're having a hard time with their garbage, or if I'm going to have the president of the biggest company in my area because everybody's got garbage, and so it's a universal thing. And the variety that, because everybody has it, it it's got a way to bring people together, which is kind of neat. Sequesters carbon in topsoil and reduces chemical fertilizer use. Uh, there are people far more qualified to talk about carbon sequestration than me. Um, but I do know there's some really cool statistics, and I should have brushed up on them. But if it's something like if we could just add like three inches of topsoil, what that does in carbon sequestration is unbelievable. So, you know, it, it, it's so important that this stuff, because it doesn't run, because it's not a liquid, because it's not going to a landfill, it's, it's going back into the soil and building that organic content and, and creating healthy soils. Uh, and phosphorus, added phosphorus is a real problem in Vermont. It's going to be a problem everywhere. Um, so, it's important that we care about what we use for fertilizer. And it can be achieved, albeit at a much longer process. It's the it's the mile run. It's not the 100-yard dash that we all want to do. We want to put and take, put that chemical fertilizer in and watch the tomatoes go crazy and not think about it. Um, so it is definitely a longer, uh, longer game. Closes the loose loop on our waste system. A uh, lot of stuff out there. Farm to table. Who's heard farm to table, right? <laughs> Who's heard table to farm? That, that's, what I, that, that's what I'm here to talk about. There's one of you in the whole room. So we have to focus on that. Um, our waste and recycling is far too lineal. We throw things away. We don't know where away is. We know the garbage guy comes. He puts it in the truck, and God knows where he goes. 
we hear some horror stories about how some things wind up, wind up in far off lands, get washed in the ocean, maybe come back to us. Um, I love the, the tangibility. Is that even a word? I don't know. Uh, the tangibility of composting. I love that I can see the food waste come in and I love that dirt goes out. Um, you know, I, I'm just as guilty on the garbage. I, I know where it goes, but you know, we just dump that and we roll it into a tractor trailer and off to the incinerator or the landfill it goes. But it's, you know, there's no, there's nothing tangible about it. And same thing with recycling. It's really rewarding to walk in the plant, watching the cardboard get bailed up and put on a tractor trailer. But again, it goes away. I, I, I know that our plastics go to Atlanta. We get turned into tracks. I know that the number ones go someplace in Ohio. I don't really know what happens. I know they pay the most. And that's, so it's like this commodity thing and it's just, it's, you're so out of touch with what happens. Compost, you can pick it up and put it in your hand when you're done. And that's, I like that about it a lot. Question. Yeah, Trevor, you, earlier you were uh, talking about composting bags. Bags? No, bands, B-A-N. Bands, yes. Food waste. Food waste bands. So, and then, then uh, you said something about you went to Burger King mm -hmm. to have them compost. So what today, say for Northern Berkshire mm -hmm. in Southern Vermont, what bans might there be on composting? Uh, so food waste bans in mass, I believe it's two ton and larger generators. And in Vermont, it's 18 ton per year um, generators. So those are kind of the levels. Uh, so then they just throw their organic waste into this waste stream? Anybody that does not fit that ban, yes, they're still allowed to throw it away. So there, there are people, and it's harder and harder to convince them because there's not the economic benefit. Composting is more expensive than garbage pickup. So it was great on the big generators, and Mass was a little was probably smarter than Vermont to to leave it at that two ton per week because that's where you see the both the environmental, a big environmental bang, and you see some savings for the customer. Uh, but when you get down into the real small generators, then you don't see that. But I'm looking at the clock, and i got to hurry up, don't I? There's, there's dinner to be had. Um, so reasons for using compost. Water savings, like I say, it can absorb 300% of its, of its weight in water, which is fantastic for kind of re slow releasing it back into your, your crops, uh, building that organic content, again, replacing the fertilizers, and in increasing microbial ac activity in soil. I met a really neat guy. He works for Casella Organics, a competitor of mine. His name is Willie. And Willie doesn't wear shoes. So Willie came to my transfer station where my office is. <laughs> I said, Willie, you're not wearing shoes. He goes, I know. I'll be okay. So we went up to this field. This is actually my family's field. And he says, you can't understand the soil unless you have your feet in the soil. <laughs> I'm like, you are a weird dude, but let's go. <laughs> so we, Willie and I went out in this field. This is compost from, uh, it was heavy on, on money. And it's a really not a great picture, but you can see at the top, you can see how it's really dark green and see how it goes to lighter green. And this picture I was trying to show, the height of this is about six inches. Where there's compost, it was double the height. It was a really bad application. It was done hastily in the spring with really wet material and we just pushed it out with a tractor. But by the end of the year, like people couldn't understand what was going on. This field was so different in the, I mean, you would have one stock with it in it and right next to it, you'd have one without it. And it was the coolest thing. It was the best experiment that we ever did. And Willie, with his bare feet, pulled back a little chunk of the compost, and, he's, and he dug into the soil, and he had a handful of soil. And when he dug here, he scratched and scratched like fingernails on a chalkboard, and it was hard pan dirt. He said, Trevor, look at the difference. I can't even get into the soil. Whereas just having the compost there, the microbial activity is loosening the soil, it's aerating it, and I can get a handful of dirt from it. He said that's, the, that's one of the things that people fail to realize is that nature's got the microbes in the soil. You just need to invigorate them and get them working. So it's not just the organic content. It's not, we're too focused in this country about the NPK. You know, it's all about the nitrogen, phosphorus, and then it doesn't need to be. There's, there's bigger things at play, and that's where compost is so valuable. Problems we face. Seeing value, not just cost of, a, of, I mean, gosh, I could just lop off the back and we could do a whole other series on this. You know, 
again, we as, as Americans often fail to see the value of something. We just look at the cost. What's it going to cost me? What's it going to cost me? What's it going to cost me? But the value is in things like cleaning up our watersheds. It is in things like not having to site another landfill, with which Massachusetts is struggling like the rest of us in the Northeast. Southbridge landfill is closing. Chicopee landfill is closing. Albany landfill is closing. Claremont, New Hampshire incinerator closed a few years back. Um, Three million tons of waste disposal capacity is coming off the market in the next uh, 18 months. And I don't see anybody putting their hand up saying, site a landfill in my town. Uh, they are pushed. Vermont has one landfill left, which is in a huge battle. It's on the Canadian border, and, and not only are the Vermonters fighting that landfill, but the Canadians have logged on because it's on Memphis and it's their water supply. So the not in my backyard, and in some cases rightfully so, has pushed the ability to site a landfill into oblivion. Um, so we have to see the value of composting to not, it's more than just soil, it's more than just saving money or spending a little bit extra. It trickles down into all these other facets of the, of the structure of our society. Um, contamination levels, we're in a really good spot with that because um, we're the hauler, all the drivers have iPhones, and we're rapid communicators. So when we pull up to a stop, and we're the composter at the end, so when the driver pulls up, sees the contamination, snaps a picture, emails it because he cares because his coworker is going to be mad when he gets to the compost site. But there's often a disconnect between like the people picking it up and then the composters and then the people trying to sell the compost. So contamination's a big issue. If you have glass in compost, the whole thing's got to get thrown away. I can never get that out and it's dangerous for somebody working on it. I'll actually take a big plastic bottle as much as I hate it. At least it's easy to screen out, easy to grab. But Caring about what goes in the compost bin is important. And then end, mar end markets. We're struggling a lot with end markets of recycling right now, and compost is one of those things. So many laws, and they're creating so much compost, but there's, no, there's not enough market. Again, that, that same financial trouble I'm in again, and now I'm at that 20, 10, 5 level trying to move so much material. And we've, we just sit on too much compost because there's not enough use out there. If only we could get our politicians to pass something, like we're trying in Vermont to mandate a 50-50 compost soil blend to replace topsoil, because the state AOTs use about 30,000 yards of topsoil on the uh, highway projects. That would be a huge boom. I don't care what county it's in. It's, it's kind of like dairy, you know. What do you do when you, when you don't make enough money in dairy? Well, you milk more cows. Well, then there's more milk, so the price drops. So you milk more cows, and then the price drops. So we don't want to go that way. We want to see more demand. So we have to push demand of recycled products. So that would be a, a great help if anybody can help with that. So here we are. Recognize that? <laughs> How old were you? That's your birthday cake. We were composting what was left. I think it was when you were two. So <laughs> um, we have to start at that age. I can tell you that because Tessa's age, when I go into elementary schools, it's awesome. And so my hope, my takeaway that you guys can, can understand that this is important to see the value in it and to be a, a champion of environmental projects, whatever they may be. And maybe it's not composting. Maybe it's, it's another part of this, this seminar. Um, but to be more active in our future, I think, is so important because, I don't know, we've got to do a good job for, for you. <laughs> so questions. I'm, I'm right at the time. Yeah, we have a couple of minutes for questions. I'll just throw one out. So, Did you? Um, oh, uh, sorry. So, um, I think you. I think you answered that uh, you will take like all of the. You know, there's like this biodegradable, compostable plastic bags. You can't do them like in your own home compost. But all of those compostable items that you know, like our food packaging that are that are um, created to be compostable, they work in your system. Yeah, kind of. So we went through a huge phase of greenwashing in this country as well. Like everything was green, everything was compostable. It's not. So what's really key is. And that, that's the other reason that we lost our, our certified for organic use, because we had such pressures from large institutions, Williams College being one of them, that they wanted the compostable ware to, to be composted. 
and that kicks you out of that certification. So we only accept BPI certified compostable ware. Composting actually changes the molecular structure. It's of the inputs. Uh, as I explained to Tess in the truck on the way here, it's like, you know, you have a, a Lego thing put together and another Lego thing put together. When you break them all down in the compost process, you literally break them completely down and then you rebuild them into something new. Stuff that's not BPI certified will biodegrade and what it does is it turns into microplastic. And so it turns into like tiny pieces, but it never changes its molecular structure. So it's really not achieving what we want at all. We need it to fully break down. Yes. Did I hear you say you were hiring? <laughs> <laughs> we're always hiring. Right now, the compost yard, we actually have a great operator, uh, but not, not at the compost yard itself. Yes. You mentioned you don't get enough wood chips, mm -hmm. um, but as I drive around and see where they cut trees down and chipped them and blown them and left them in piles, mm -hmm. Can't there be some sort of connection? There can, and, and we've done, uh, so it's all about dollars and cents with that. So we need to have our wood chips at our yard for $4 a yard. That's kind of like the, the behind the veil number that I, that I know that we need. So we have a lot of tree clearing guys that are so happy. We've got a couple spots at our different locations that they drop their wood chips and they, they get rid of them for free and we take them and it costs us a couple bucks to get them up there. We'll branch out a little bit and haul from a further distance, um, but there's kind of like a economical ring that we have to get them within that. But when you are within that, we've, we've worked with towns and we've, we've started to get them to, to kind of like, guys, it's, it's really not much more work. Can you just blow it into the back of the truck and drive it, you know, three, four minutes uh, to one of the locations? And that's coming around. Uh, so we are making headway there. There was some place where people who were doing their own could bring it instead of cutting it up and taking it to the transfer station and put it mm -hmm. there. If they could take it and throw it through a chipper mm -hmm. and make a big pile for somebody to either bring to you or have that on your location. Yeah, the scale that we need wood chips at is kind of mind boggling. Um, so we need like. A dump truck's about 12 yards. We go through probably 8,000 yards a year. So whatever, 8,000 divided by 12, that's how many dump trucks we need. Um, so it's a steady... My mind is just turning. No, up. it's great. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, and that's just it. This is a scalable problem, um, and it can be fixed on a community level. It can be fixed on a neighborhood level. Uh, environmental champions are equally as valuable if you get eight of your neighbors to do a little compost bin or if you have a thousand customers doing it because I can't fit every market. You know, larger institutions like TAM, we're not really set up for like the one and two residential things and that's what we're worried about in 2020 with the residential ban is because there's so much scalping of the market. So many people have home compost bins, or they take it to the transfer station, or they bring it to a chicken farmer. And so we don't have the density to do it right. So small niche folks coming on and taking your two yards of, of wood chips and but putting it into a, a neighborhood compost is this total slam dunk, and that's just what you need to succeed. So, yeah, I don't mean to diminish it in any way as less important. It's just not for, for our size. Yes. This is uh, just out of curiosity. I was wondering, does it matter what kind of wood chips you have? Like, would like deciduous trees be better than coniferous trees, or something like that? Or Good is question. That <laughs> yeah. So uh, pine, it, a pH. So we never even talked about pH. Again, we could spend a whole night talking about pH. So you got to watch your pH, and pine will affect that. Pine needles, especially. Um, so. We run on the higher side of pH. We run about a 7.7, 7, um, which neutral is 7. Um, not exactly where we want to be, and it's higher because of that high carbon wood ash with that charcoal I was talking about. Um, but a lot of soils in Vermont, anybody that's using lime on a farm field would like our compost to, to give a simple thing, because lime is, is high pH. We're on the higher side pH. Uh, but some crops, some 
soils, they're like, oh no, you're seven, seven, we don't want it. Uh, we want to be seven or six, five, because they're already running as a base. So I would say I want to make sure that the students can get to dinner. Um, but if there are other questions, please stick around. I think Trevor will hang yeah. up for a few more minutes. Um, thank you all for coming in. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Thanks, guys.